Hey, <laughs> what's going on? Hey, buddy? pretty good. Uh, kind of cold and rainy here, but otherwise good. We could have hot and dry if you wanted to be in Texas with us. Right. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty much yeah. from now until maybe like May or June. It's basically cold and rainy is uh, is uh-huh. what we do here. I would love that. That sounds great. So, Jason, nice to see you on the Cowboys. Um, for everybody that doesn't know this, Jason lives in the Netherlands, and this is a great story. Um, if you wouldn't mind, tell people how in the world did you get from where you started to where you are? Yeah. Oh, I mean, how how long do you have? Well, I, I know. <laughs> well, we only have an hour scheduled for this. Um, you no, know, I mean the uh, the short ish version is, you know, sometimes I joke that I I feel like I was one of the least likely people to end up working in financial services. You know, I studied political science, sociology. I went and served in the Peace Corps, so I actually I had the very difficult hard assignment of living in the Caribbean for a couple of years in St. Lucia. Um, And when I moved back to my hometown of Chicago, realized I probably needed to get a real job uh, and ended up working for uh, a company that's still around actually in the lending space, Enova, um, which more recently acquired OnDeck, the small business lender. Um, And that was really like my entry point. Went from there to lend up out in San Francisco, you know, helped build Marcus at Goldman, which they're now dismantling, Um, (laughs) moved uh, moved to London to work for a private student lending company there. And and ultimately, um, family brought me here to the Netherlands. My partner moved here for work and and I relocated here as well. And that was uh, coming up on four years ago. That's fun. I love it. Yeah, I I keep up with you on all your travels to Mexico City and New York and all the different places you're puzzling too and uh it's, it's well fun. and and texas later this year yes yeah, we're looking forward to having you man that. that'll be fun yeah we uh last year it was really cool the last couple of few years it's just a, it's a lot of senior mostly chairman ceos mostly banks some fintech but that group has kind of quietly become more and more bass focused institutions yeah. right and so i think it was about two-thirds of them that came last year and it was just a cool sort of an intimate and fun setting, you know, where everybody can sit back and have the real non-public conversations. So you'll enjoy it, man. Yeah, you'll fit right in. We're trying to I'm looking it, forward to it. We're making a point every time of just that, you know, there's so many people like, why don't you make it bigger? And it's like, oh boy, it'd be easy to do. We always have a wait list. Uh, but we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to meet every single person there. The way it's a community. Three day span, because it really is the innovation brainiacs of our industry and uh, get everybody together is pretty cool well speaking of which so i thought of this man i'm just gonna say it if it's okay with you guys uh it's so cool like let's just use the word insiders right so i think about a lot of these more public conversations that we all have on a lot of these key topics certainly things like compliance right and some of the recent woes that have gone on Behind the scenes, especially in the banking as a service space from the institution side, and then a lot of what's gone on from the fintech side, now more and more the brand side of the world, right? And everything that's really interesting. I feel like there's a different conversation happening amongst the insiders than I wouldn't say the outsiders, but the folks that are looking to learn and educate and get more into the space, yeah. right? And so I feel like there's a different sentiment, is that, a, is that a fair statement? What's cool is everybody watching today, you want to know what we all talk about behind the scenes? <laughs> there you, you go. You get to have one right here. Yeah. And I mean, it's a different conversation, isn't it, Jason? I mean, a lot of the things that you, I, we all get to have these conversations they're all day, every day. Colorful. Yes, they are more colorful <laughs> conversations. But do you see the same thing that the sentiment of the insiders is a little different? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, the you know, people who have been in the space for a longer period of time, and particularly those who have the benefit of a wide network in the space, there's just a sort of different access to information that that comes with that and having that network versus, you know, if you're, you know, just consuming information that's, that, as you said, is public. So something on American Banker or TechCrunch or wherever, you know, it, it may be, quite a different uh, version of reality, I guess, let's put it that way. And and as you put it out, you know, people who are newer to the space, and and I do still get, you know, quite a number of 
um, young slash early, you know, early stage founders who will occasionally reach out to me and, you know, pitch an idea or, or ask for help getting connected with bank partners or phrasing. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you're just getting started, the the access to information you have is far more limited. And, and so your sort of point of view and level of, let's say, optimism versus pessimism m- may be quite a bit different. <laughs> well, that's exactly where I was heading. I, I think the insiders are very optimistic in this space yeah. and the outsiders are less so. I, what I was just going to say is look, that is an excellent point because everybody went real quiet. You know, when we started having regulatory things popping up, and these things have always been there. We all knew it. It was like a time bomb. And we're trying to clean up behind the scenes as fast as we can with a mop and a broom, right? And to get this thing to where that didn't happen. And of course it did. But it doesn't change the fact that this is still an enormous opportunity. And it's still in the early stages of the game. It's transformational, and, I think. And so all the big topic, talking people, you know, and they're say, talking heads all the time. You know, they kind of went quiet. Right. At, at the moment that maybe everybody should be speaking up, that this is still one hell of an opportunity. Probably more so. I think it's a sign of maturity. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, um, and I certainly have not been in, in, in the industry as long as you guys have, particularly because the majority of my um, my operating career was in non-bank lenders, right? I mean, I, I um, spent a lot of time in small dollar, which was state licensed. And so that sort of whole banking ecosystem and in the regulatory apparatus that went along with that uh to be to be blunt i just like didn't pay as much attention to i was more worried about cfpb and you know small dollar rulemaking and udap and all that stuff and it was really only in maybe the last you know two and a half three years that i've started paying far more attention uh and in my opinion far more consequential as far as shaping the direction of the industry and to your point you know it's like Facing either, you know, behind the scenes, supervisory discussions with regulators, MRAs, MRIs, not new, you know, even public enforcement actions, you know, there have been banks in this, you know, we didn't use the word bass, whatever, five or 10 years ago, but, you know, there have been actions that are related, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, related to these kinds of partnerships, you know, going back you know, many years. And so I don't think it's like, oh, the sky is falling, like this model is ending. You know, particularly, and this really struck me at the um, the Federal Reserve's conference in Philadelphia recently, it's like there is, there is no other path forward. You know, there is no fintech license, there is no payment institution license or e-money license the way that some other jurisdictions have. And so, you know, to be blunt, like there is no other option. And I think some uh, legislators ha- and regulators, for that matter, may have a sort of sense of, you know, nostalgia uh, to try to like turn back the clock to the small town bank relationship banking, etc. Uh, but that just ignores the reality that's staring us in the face. I mean, all you need to do is look at a chart of the number of char- number of chartered banks or number of bank branches and realize like this direction of travel is inexorable. So how do you, you know, both on, on the banking side, how do you respond to that? As well as on the regulatory side, how do you respond to that? Well, this, is, this is great. And I'll give you a little pushback here. This is the cool part about oh. listening. When people talk to each other that done this, is that, you know, the relationship side of the, let's say community banking has been the lifeblood of what they do. And it, the catch is to not lose that and then a plus one, right? So the plus one being the break your geography, use these other mm-hmm. sources of source of income. It's frustrating as hell to watch people talk about, you know, how are we going to grow deposits and we got to pay this much or pay that rate? When in fact, people will pay you to bring deposits to your institution in this model. And uh, it's just not logical from to try to put one or the other, you know? From it's my both. viewpoint, I think you're both right. And the question lies on where who best intersects between the two. Right. I think that's going to be the ultimate question. And so, I mean, look, I think Jason made an awesome point there about what are their choices there and to kind of chew that up a little bit. I think the banking community looks too much at the fintech world and specifically, Jason, I think we call it the challenger space. Right. right that's right. what the bankers are thinking about. And I think that the thesis is that that is the only thing that's going on. Nobody wants to talk about Apple or Starbucks or Home Depot or right. Right. And so I think to your point, 
these folks, especially your lifestyle brands, your retailers that are searching for sticky customers and loyalty and relationships, more app driven than physical cards in the past. Yeah, but that, these folks are gonna are gonna take that's a big word now. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that's an interesting space. Well, and, and you know the capabilities that the underlying bank partners provide go beyond holding deposits, right? I mean that that certainly the sort of neo bank challenger. Um, you know, I think is the most visible, in, including, you know, in the in the work that I do, because like, if you have to put a disclaimer on the website that says, you know, FDIC insured by blank partner bank, you know, it makes it easier to understand the relationships. But there are other capabilities, whether it's on the lending side, whether it's on the payment processing side, that are maybe, um, you know, less, you know, less obvious to some people. Absolutely. No I, if, if we look into the numbers, of all of the parts and pieces that are going on, it's about 80% card side, right? And I mean, if you wanted to touch on that a little bit, lending is a heck of a lot harder for the sponsor. Is that a, probably the primary reason? Uh, I mean, I think that that is a, a, a fair encapsulation, right? I mean, coming, coming from the lending business myself, I mean, just the, you know, the additional um, logistical piece of, you know, if you're a non-bank lender, leveraging a bank, you know, a partner bank to write those loans, more than likely you also need to bring debt capital with you, which even in good times, you know, to get started is not easy. Um, I was actually uh, meeting with some startups here in Amsterdam in the Techstars program this week. And, you know, a couple of them were lending related. And I'm like, oh, this is not the best climate to be out, you know, hunting for for a debt capital provider for a brand new product with, you know, no history of repayment, no loan tape that you can go show them. Like it's it could be the best idea, but the wrong point in the cycle and an uphill battle. Yeah, um, I tell people a lot that that's yeah. the key if you're going to do the lending side is what's your source. You know, if you've got a yeah. VA source or some other cool source that's a necessity. Just, I mean, like pouring water out of a bucket. You know, right. it's an easy deal for you, but yeah. you go out yeah. to the crowdsource funding or other, you know. Mechanism. Personal loans, <laughs> yeah, yeah, tough, tough road, more difficult. Well, well, and and as you pointed out, beyond that piece, just the the number of regulatory pieces is is significantly more complicated, right? I mean, uh, beyond UDAP, which is quite expensive, also dealing with Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, handling, um, you know, furnishing data to credit bureaus. It's just a lot more involved, and I think on on the partner bank side, that's part of the reason why you've seen, I mean, really just a handful. I, off the top of my head, I would say it's like Cross River, Web Bank, Celtic. Um, I'm sure there's probably one or two I'm forgetting, but uh, specialize in in those lending programs. No, I agree completely. I think, I mean, even think about things like CRA, right? Yeah. I mean, that come into play and are actually fairly fluid. And I mean, a lot, I think a lot of these things that have come up, look, you think about um, all of these parts and pieces that have been an issue of visibility, I think, that certainly have taken the regulators more time to get the visibility and then to frankly unwind the visibility and provide guidance yeah. that for a long time people were rocking and rolling and, and moving along without knowing what was okay. And you got you know? you know, let's kind of peel off the bandaid here a little bit that, I mean, you said something great a second ago, Jason, that consent orders aren't anything new for these folks in this space. And all of a sudden it got to be a big headline when it's something that's happened 15 times in the same bank and it's not that it's not the end of the world. Right? But now all of a sudden it is. And all the talking heads want to go real quiet right now and everybody turtle up. And that scares the hell out of everybody looking to get into this business at exactly the right moment to get into it. Mm -hmm. And the big thing, which is the elephant in the room, is compliance. And you know, how do we continue to have this issue come up? You know, what what is it? Why don't they see it? You know, and, and one of the things that we beat the hell out of the, you know, when it's a direct model, it's so much easier going through all of this. But when you go to that connector model, it just limits visibility, not only for the bank. And I mean, I'm not trying to let the banker completely off the hook, but what you don't know, it's really hard you to fix know. what the hell you don't know, <laughs> right? But the questions then become, even if they didn't know, should they have known? And then it's how in the heck would they have known, right? And it becomes this really nasty picture. And I think that's what I love about so much visibility that you bring. Man. You highlight the heck out of those questions, right? Which I think ultimately shines a light on the model. You do so good. Yes. yes. 
I, I mean, something that I'm, you know, cognizant of in, you know, in watching the space and, and also whatever, writing, commentating on the space is there are, you know, dramatic differences between the players, right? I mean, depending on who you consider to be a partner bank, you know, maybe there's 50, 70, whatever that sort of play in this space. And, you know, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, and whatever, half a dozen or so of these connectors, um, as you describe them. And, and, you know, my concern is that, you know, it's not clear that the regulators understand the differences between the models, you know, direct versus using a connector and uh, say a connector that maybe holds some of its own licenses versus those that are more a um, introducer and software layer. I mean, frankly, even people in the business often have a hard time describing exactly what the differences are. And the, the net effect may be and I think to a certain extent, we're already seeing this kind of a chilling effect of everyone wanting to pull back because, you know, they know that, that, you know, the regulatory storm is coming, if not here already. Um, and, you know, they don't want to be caught, caught out in it. And so sort of everything, you use the word turtle up, which I like, you know, sort of just like, let's wait and see what happens. We don't want to get ourselves any more exposed. And like, let's see how this shakes out before we sort of take on any more risk. And I'm just hoping that there isn't sort of a regulatory overreaction, which I'm myself not a fan of crypto, but it, in a sense, you know, what we've seen there is, uh, you know, regulators come down, you know, they can't legally say you absolutely cannot do this, but they can functionally make it so unattractive that, that that's the net effect. And I'm really, really hoping that that is not the outcome we see for more traditional fintech in the you know the payments the debit card the lending space because i think you know it'll hurt it, it's going to hurt banks and it's going to hurt consumers absolutely it's something you tapped on there you know there's like a, a one-to-one relationship with some connectors and then there's a one-to-many that goes yeah. on with some of these connector models and this one's dangerous as hell right yeah. and uh, everybody's like well you should have more than one sponsor and it's like that Ooh. is such a broad statement Cut your tongue off. Don't talk anymore. Careful, careful. careful. Don't sit in the corner. Right. It's way more complicated. But uh, on the regulatory front, we we've had regulators as clients since God, I was in my twenties, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, but to be able to have a one to one conversation with them as this has evolved and you know and grown, mm -hmm. the education level gap between let's say the cutting edge people like yourself versus the regulatory figures was it was enormous. a lot of catch and uh, it's getting better. And, and they're beginning to start to tie all the pieces. I think some of the third party uh, guidance and uh, different it's approaches that are that. going on, they're, you're seeing them beginning to get their connecting the dots. One thing you said about crypto, man, I was hanging out at <laughs> IBAT conference past week and uh, this girl was telling me her background and she you know, went to this company and that company. And she goes, then I smoked a little crypto for a while. Kind of her time out in your career. Right, That's right. Great. That's exactly the point, right, is coming off the backs of that, there's some of those earmarks in this space that are, I think, falsely identified, but it's got that vibe that you were talking about that is keeping people a little standoffish, and that may, I think this one's a heck of a lot different, and you're going to wish that you hadn't set out. I don't think it's as optional as people think. That's a great yeah. question. Is it optional? It, is, I'm sorry. Is which piece optional? Just being involved in Bass in general. As opposed mm. to sitting in your little local community as a banker. No, I mean, uh, I sincerely believe, and by no means am I an expert on small community banks. You know, outside of the outside of the scope of sort of like the Bass and Partner Bank stuff. Um, but you know, given the you know medium to long term trajectory of banking in the U.S. and, and I mean. Particularly have living, you know, having lived in the UK, living in the Netherlands now, you know, most other developed Western countries have far fewer banks than the United States does, far higher banking concentration. And obviously there's all sorts of historical reasons why, you know, dual federal state banking systems and interstate banking restriction, branch banking, et cetera. Um, but the Netherlands has functionally like three banks. I mean, obviously, it's a much smaller country, but Canada, I think, has like three or four. Mexico has maybe five. Um, and the pressure, 
You can take Texas and lay it over Europe. I actually, <laughs> this is a good one, guys. The Texas economy just yeah. broke the, the the size range of being larger than Canada. Whoa. So wearing a cowboy yeah. hat, yeah. Well, it's yeah. like, you want to meet Canadians now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the, the inexorable pressure is towards concentration and, and the technology piece as well as the the regulatory burdens um, only amplify that, right? So being big and being at scale, particularly as you know, geographic footprint, as the branch network becomes less important, inherently advantages uh, companies, banks that are good at technology and good at digital distribution. And you know, as we've seen, you know, really fairly consistently since you know 2007 2008 crisis maybe dialed back at certain points the the regulatory and compliance burdens you know ac across the board you know across different um areas you know tend to increase and institutions that are larger and better funded you know tend to have an advantage in in the economics of meeting those requirements and so you know on the one hand you know i don't think that regulators to be blunt, regulators appointed by either party, I don't think want to see a world where we have like five banks and it's like Chase, Bank of America, Wells, City. Like, I don't think that's an outcome that anybody wants. But on the flip side, like some of the decisions being made are actually encouraging that. And I see Bass and partner banking, you know, as probably the most viable avenue for smaller local banks to you know expand distribution both sourcing deposits and customers and writing loans um you know without having to go hire all their own technologists which you know 4000 community banks are probably not out there hiring software engineers and product managers when they're competing with Google and Facebook and Goldman Sachs and everybody else and so you know I do think that it is you know, probably the most viable model for uh, community banks to to diversify. Obviously, you know, keep that local community base and continue to serve their existing customer base, but also to diversify. And done correctly, um, I think it has the opportunity to actually really strengthen the resiliency of those institutions and the communities they serve. I mean, the example, I forget who I was talking to who brought this up. I mean, if you have a you know, a local bank in Mississippi or in Florida where, you know, they're heavy into commercial real estate and maybe, you know, mortgage lending, but it's all in a very tight geographic area, like that presents a very real risk. Whereas Bass Partner Banking could, you know, has the potential to allow to diversify the base of deposits as well as how those deposits are deployed as assets. So again, done correctly, I think it can actually you know, improve resiliency and improve risk management. And the question is just who's doing who's doing it in a way that does that and who's doing it in a way that actually increases risk. And I, I, I hope that that is what regulators are trying, the lens that they're taking. Well, they, they will eventually. That was yeah. <laughs> well said. I mean, I mean, yes, that was, uh, there was a lot to unpack. I'm going to go back and listen to what you <laughs> did. So that was so, I heard branch baking laws. I mean, you, yes. Okay. So I've been yes, accused so. of being older than a lot of people out there, which I think is totally unfair. You're the smartest because uh, you're the last I'm guy. I'm not going to you know, leverage that into you know, some type of, of situation uh, over you you guys and your youth. Our but, youth and inexperience. Yeah, that's unfair. <laughs> but uh, I watched all this stuff unfold. I remember there were zillions more banks than there are today. And then we changed the... You know, Glass-Steagall, then we, you know, repealed Glass-Steagall, then we changed the branch banking laws, and there was a massive advantage if you were able to have branches in every state, and it's like, hey, my, my kid got, you know, football scholarship, or my kid is going to go off to college here or there, and it's like, well, do we have a local branch where the college is? And that advantage right there was tremendous for the bigger banks, and then, of course, we have 2008, and it's like, hey, come into a meeting, walk out with Merrill Lynch. You know, it's like, wow, that was cool. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff like that that went on. And we just ended up with this too big to fail. And to your point, it's how I think everybody almost now by default continues to fall in that direction, even though everyone's beginning to see the damage that that could cause 
and we have way too big of a geographic footprint to try to rely on four or five banks to cover that. But to your point, in every conversation, be it PPP, recently yeah. with SVB and FDIC deposit insurance, it's an undertone of, of like the pill has been swallowed, right? Right, And you can't undo that. That but The conversation yeah. that's going on with the regulatory folks behind the scenes conversation that nobody wants to, or that like, please don't tell anybody who said this kind of conversation is just that, that everyone realizes the entire banking system was built around geography. Every part of your charter application, every single thing that you do, CRA, every single bit of it is built around a geographic location. And all of a sudden, just like when they change those laws, the springs are flying out of the machine now all of a yep. sudden bang you know so it's like there's a go out and play moment mm -hmm. where you can leave your geographic location if you do it in a smart way in a compliant way you don't even have to race to do it there's so much opportunity still that's out there but ignoring it because the headlines are, are against you right now it's like i can't get my board to understand that or whatever how do you think we fix some of that i mean how do we take advantage of this Thank you for riding along with the FinTech Cowboys. Stay tuned for part two of this episode.